Reality television seems to be everywhere these days. I mean, you turn on any channel, and there's at least six or seven shows on the schedule on any given channel that are reality-based. Now, a lot of people deride reality TV as being trash TV and that it doesn't, doesn't do anything for our culture. But the fact is that reality television has been around for quite a while. It began in the 1940s with the Candid Camera television show. It was pretty popular and it lasted many decades. Um, reality TV has tended to branch out into different genres, subgenres, if you will. There's game shows, there's your cop dramas like Cops, and, you know, Lock Up Raw on MSNBC. Then you've got your Southern culture reality TV, which tends to be driving the market right now. You've got your Duck Dynasty, Honey Boo Boo. You've got your family generational dramas that are modeled on a television show from the 70s called An American Family. The real world actually modeled on, on that show. And you've got shows like John and Kate Plus Eight, The Osbournes, that all are descended from that type of show. I decided to pick 12 TV shows from the reality TV genre that I feel were the most important, they might not be the most popular, but they are the most important to the genre, and the ones that I feel were the most groundbreaking for culture as a whole. Now, a lot of these did not get, get many runs on television. Some of them never even made it to the air, but the premise or the the meaning behind the show was more important than the actual show itself. There's one event in particular that has affected nearly every reality television show since the 1990s, and that was 9-11. On September 11th, when the, t the Twin Towers fell, it actually caused the American viewing public to step back from the reality TV genre, and a lot of shows actually failed. Because, for one thing, our televisions were filled with nothing but news for like three whole months. September 11th, the nation kind of went into a collective paralysis, a collective depression, and reality TV didn't seem as important anymore. So a lot of shows got the axe. There were some shows like Survivor, The Amazing Race, Big Brother, that no one expected to survive. But, they actually, they're... they're parent company, CBS, the one that was putting them on, decided to stick with them, and they've proven to be very, very popular. Big Brother will never go away because the host of the show is actually married to the president of CBS. So Big Brother's here to stick around for a while. Survivor has, it has definitely had a lasting effect on reality TV genre, and it will be around for a while. Amazing Race continues to win Emmys every single year for its innovative programming. All three shows got their start on CBS, and CBS is definitely the king of reality television. And all three shows were affected by 9-11. In fact, in on Big Brother, it was in the second season, Big Brother 2, one of the house guests on the show was in the final three when the attacks occurred. And the show's premise is that you're stuck in a house with no contact to the outside world. And for most of the seasons, that has been true. But that particular season, the producers did decide to actually tell the house guests that were on the inside about the events of the day. Because Monica, one of the house guests, had a cousin who was never found, and she worked in the World Trade Center. The Amazing Race got its start that same year, and the very first scene, of the opening credits, takes place right in front of the World Trade Center, and they're talking about New York, you know, being the, you know, the beginning and the end of the race around the world. There's been a Amazing Race curse that has followed over the years, because there's certain areas where Amazing Race has gone to film, where those locations, either a few months or a few years down the line, are damaged or destroyed due to some sort of disaster. Um, Amazing Race was in Mumbai one year when there were terrorist attacks that occurred at the stations where 
Amazing Race had filmed just a few months before, and actually the attacks came right around the same time that the, air, the episodes actually aired. And in one of those episodes, one of the challenges revolved around them picking up suitcases in a station <laughs> that were just randomly left in the station, which turns out that was actually how the terrorist attacks happened, was unattended luggage in these stations. A couple of the locations where Amazing Race is filmed, there were earthquakes. And one of the pairs that was competing in Amazing Race in that first season had a connection directly to 9-11. The same thing has affected other reality TV shows like Murder in Small Town X, which was a very promising show on Fox. The winner of that first and only season of Murder in Small Town X actually died at the World Trade Center. He was a firefighter. Survivor was in their Africa edition during that particular year, and that was their lowest ratings in quite a while. And most people thought that that show would never recover, but it did, and it's now the strongest of all the genres. So I'm going to go through a list of the 12 reality TV shows that I think are the most groundbreaking and the most important to the genre and to the culture in general. As far as the United States is concerned, there have only been two reality TV shows that take place within a house, the hidden camera type TV shows, that have been immensely popular since An American Family, which took place way back in the 70s. And that is the Big Brother, which got its start in the early 2000s. And the Real World, which has been around since the 90s. It got its start on TV, and it's still going strong. Doesn't get as many viewers now as it used to. But the Real World was a defining moment in this genre. But for number 12, the most influential reality TV show on my list is The Glass House on ABC. It is a failed show. It is not coming back for a second season. We all kind of know this. The thing that made The Glass House groundbreaking was just the set design. We had gotten used to these reality TV hidden camera houses being fairly flat, uninspiring. In the real world, the locations where the houses are are usually breathtaking, but the houses themselves are kind of boring. But Big Brother, other than the fact they do a new design every single year, it's still nothing but IKEA furniture in the house, so it's kind of bland and boring. Well, the glass house was literally built from the ground up to be different. It was made out of glass. It's very striking, very modern. Um, even the backyard is technically an indoor space where they compete for their challenges. The house also brought back viewer voting, which hadn't been seen in any other American reality TV shows since Big Brother 1, that first season. And it failed miserably on Big Brother 1. Even though that season had about 30 million viewers, which was astronomical for reality TV show at that time, they now average about 10 to 12 million viewers um, on average through the season. But Big Brother 1 allowed the viewers to vote out the house guests. Now, of course, the viewers, they don't like the mean ones. They don't like the drama queens. So the most interesting characters on the show ended up getting voted off. And the people that were in the house were like, mm, maybe I should just sit here and do nothing and be really nice and America will love me. And they will end up giving me the half million dollars. And that's, ended up, that's exactly what ended up happening. The Glass House returned to those roots, allowed the viewers to make a vote, and of course the viewers tended to not, <laughs> not reward the more interesting people in the house. The winner was Kevin. I didn't like Kevin throughout the season. He actually had, for a while, been viewed as a bully. And the viewers kept bringing back people that Kevin was trying to get out. So that was one good thing about the viewer voting, was they actually got to bring people back. 
But even though the glass house failed, it will be remembered for future seasons. Most notably, it inspired the Big Brother Canada house, because Canada got their own version of Big Brother. You could see a lot of similarities between the glass house and the Big Brother Canada house. And we've heard rumors that the Big Brother house this season, for season 15, is going to be a lot different. And in my opinion, I think what they are going to do is they are going to actually rebuild the house and make it look a lot more aesthetically pleasing. I would love that, because the glass house was absolutely amazing the way it looked. The glass house also had a personality in the house itself. And... She spoke through this mirrored glass that a lot of the viewers named, because the house called her the Oracle for the first, like, three weeks. But she was ended up getting a name, Fari. Fari was her name, which stood for Faux Siri. Because she sounded a lot like Siri from the Apple products. And... Her name, Fari, meant faux Siri, because she was a fake Siri. Even though Fari was very interesting, she really did not do much for the game. When they actually did challenges involving the glass screen, they tended to have to write on tablets, like dry race boards, and hold their answers up like this. It didn't make any sense. They should have been doing it on tablets, like on iPads or something. That would have been innovative and groundbreaking, but loss the glass house is number 12 on my list. In the early 2000s, most of reality TV was actually being ported over to this side of the Atlantic from Europe. Survivor got its start as a TV project called Project Robinson. Um, Big Brother was originally a British television show. Who Wants to Be a Millionaire was ported over as a version of a show that was popular in Europe. A lot of television shows, like Pop Idol from Europe, inspired American Idol. The only show on my top 12 list that is a game show was The Weakest Link. It too was a port over from England. But it was very unique. Most game shows in the United States did not involve eliminating people. It just involved a straight winner. Like, if you were the best, like Jeopardy, if you made the most money, you would win. It's plain and simple. Wheel of Fortune, you got the most money, you won. If you were the best at solving puzzles, you won. If you were the best at solving trivia, you won. If you were the, you know, the most attractive and most you know, likable male, you won. No one got eliminated, technically. The Weakest Link changed that. And like most portovers from Europe, The Weakest Link had a snappy little British host, Anne Robinson. She was a total bitch. And it was so fun watching her. The way that they would compete was you would have a circle of contestants around Anne, the host. And Anne would, you know, kind of pivot on this segue-type podium. She would go around, she would ask questions in a Tom format. And your, your goal was to answer the questions correctly, they were trivia questions. Your answer would build a bank. And you could go around this whole circle, and if you said bank, then you would get to lock in that amount of money for your whole group. You, basically, you all were trying to raise the bank as a collective group. But after every round, whoever was considered the least smart, least helpful, or slowest player was then voted off by the rest of the contestants. And Anne would go around and ask you why you wanted to vote them off, and she would usually be very, you know, rude in her questioning of you. And at the end, whoever had the most votes to be eliminated was told by Ann Robinson, you are the weakest link. And they were gone. 
It's very innovative in the fact that they actually had an elimination throughout the competition until the final end. A lot of the people learned the strategy of how to do this. Of course, it was in your best interest to eliminate the slowest people and the dumbest people throughout the first six rounds of the competition. But as you get towards the end, you kind of wanted to keep the dumb ones. You would kind of form alliances. So it would be like three or four people that would vote in tandem and they would start voting out the smartest ones. Then in the final two, the final three, the smartest person very rarely made it to the end of the game because they were already voted out. It was usually two of the, you know, the floaters that went through the whole entire round. And then they battled to the death, basically. And whoever won got to take the whole bank home. It's very innovative in how they presented that show. And that's the reason why The Weakest Link is the only game show to show up on this list. Now, most people would think that I would pick American Idol or The X Factor as the singing competitions, you know, pick for this list. While they were groundbreaking, I actually picked The Voice from NBC, which is still currently running. I think this is like its fourth season. I prefer The Voice over American Idol and X Factor. The main reason why is that The Voice was the first singing talent show to focus more on the actual talent and the voice of the contestants than on looks and marketability. The way they do it is the coaches, and from season to season they do tend to change. The coaches will sit in chairs that are facing the audience. The talent will come out on stage. They will sing, and based on their voice, hence the voice, the coaches would turn around and they would choose to have that, that contestant to be on their team. If only one coach turned around, that person was stuck on their team. But if more than one coach turned around, they would compete to try to get the contestant to be on their team. So the contestant actually got to choose who they wanted to be with. This is kind of unlike X Factor, which is another show that came out the same year that focused on the judges mentoring the contestants. But that idea for both shows was novel. But on the X Factor, the judges chose the talent. And it was usually based on demographics like your age, or, you know, if you were singing solo or in a group. With the voice, the contestants got to choose the judges. And just like the X Factor, the voice actually will have battles between contestants to determine who will end up making it to the finals. The voice tended to focus more on talent and less on the humiliating, you know, aspects of the auditions. Everyone that appears on the voice, at least, even the worst person that has ever appeared on the voice, is marginally better than half the people that make it through on American Idol. It is true. The Voice has a lot better talent on that show. And that is the reason why The Voice comes in at number 10 on my list. Now, number 9 on my list is from one of the MTV networks. It's from Logo. Before RuPaul's Drag Race premiered, female impersonation was pretty much a sideshow. If you wanted to see a drag show, you would go to your local bar on the weekends, local gay bar. And that was pretty much your only way to see a drag queen, unless you went to a pageant. The only time drag queens competed was in pageants, and let's face it, the pageants are one-sided. You're more attractive, you're more creative queens, could go through, but your camp queens, your comedy queens, they really didn't have a forum until RuPaul's Drag Race. And I think that's why RuPaul's Drag Race is groundbreaking. It made drag queens mainstream. And a lot of the drag queens that have been on the show 
have gone on to be very well known, mainly because of the MTV marketing machine. But through the wonders of auto-tune, any drag queen now who can't sing at all can go on the show and RuPaul will make you a iTunes success. So now you have mainstream names like Sharon Needles and Tyra Sanchez. These are queens that now have national exposure where they used to only be local celebrities. So that's the reason why RuPaul's Drag Race comes in at number 9 on my top 12 list. Ooh. Number 8 on my list is a show that most people have never heard of. It's called Murder in Small Town X. It was a show that actually had a lot of promise and it premiered on the Fox Network in 2001. The creepy thing about Murder in Small Town X is that it ended its television run on September 8, 2001. The winner of that season was a firefighter from the NYPD named Angel. Angel went into the World Trade Center a couple of days after the show ended and died in the terrorist attacks of September 11th. The premise behind Murder in Small Town X was kind of complicated and it did take a little while for me to actually get into the plot of the show. It's more or less a clue type murder mystery. It was very unique in that it blended several genres into the plot of the show. The show took place in the town of Eastport, Maine. Now, the entire town actually became a television set during the run of this show, and it was renamed Sunrise, Maine, for the purposes of the show. And a lot of the townspeople, real townspeople, actually were paid actors for the purposes of the show. And the contestants that were competing were actually supposed to be investigators, and they actually went out and, you know, took the prints, did this, you know, real investigation with real police work to solve a fictional murder that took place in the town before they got there. Every week, one person would be designated in the challenge as the lifeguard, the lead investigator. The very first episode they had to actually pick cards to determine the lifeguard. But in subsequent episodes, the lifeguard was chosen by the previous person that had been eliminated. So you needed to really, really have a good alliance in this game to make it very far. That's why I think this show needs to come back. It's very interesting. The person that is eliminated on the previous episode falls victim to the murderer. So, considering the fact that there were ten contestants in the beginning who came to solve a fictional murder of a family in the very first episode, they're basically dealing with a serial killer. Because by the end, the bodies are, it's like twelve people that have been killed killed. Actually, none of these people were killed. They were just killed off in this clue game. And it's funny, the irony of this is that the eventual winner of the show survived this serial killing spree in the small town in Maine, only to tragically really be killed by real murderers a few days after the show ended. It was very tragic. And out of all of the shows that fell victim to September 11th, Murder in Small Town X is the show that really, really, really took the biggest hit and fell most miserably. They were not renewed for a second season because of the, the fallout. They got more publicity after September 11th because their winner died than the actual plot of the show or the promise of the show. So that's when a lot of reality TV shows started getting the axe. 
and unfortunately Murder in Small Town X got the axe. One last thing about Murder in Small Town X. From the very first episode, it really wasn't mentioned throughout the rest of the season. The family that was murdered at the very beginning of the show supposedly had ties to the Pearl Harbor attacks that defined America for generation. And the show really clenched onto that and made that a huge, huge deal in that first episode. So it also was ironic that the show got its start in Pearl Harbor and then was incapped with the September 11 tragedy. Now number eight on my list, I mean number seven, sorry we're already up to number seven, is actually not a competition show at all. Now there are some people that get rewarded at the end of every episode. So there is some type of reward relationship here. But it's a true reality TV show. There are no no edits, no acting to this show. Other than the way people will react when you put a camera in front of somebody's face, they're not going to act exactly like they do in real life. So in that regard, it is a little bit scripted. But it's Undercover Boss from the Reality Giants over at CBS. It's a feel-good show. In a time when most Americans don't trust the corporate world, we see the rich as being predators. This show took CEOs and rich businessmen and women out of their comfort zones and their cushy, you know, nice, cool air conditioned offices and actually made them do the peons work. They had to do janitor work. The McDonald's CEO actually had to learn how to make McDonald's sandwiches, and you would be surprised at how little these people that run these companies know about their own businesses. They know nothing. But they walk away with more of an appreciation of their underlings' trials and tribulations, and they really get to know these people. And it is very inspiring to watch the show. Out of all of the shows on my list, I think this one probably is one of my favorites. I really, really have liked every single episode that I've ever seen of Undercover Boss. It really is a very nice, neat premise to the show. And I'm not sure how many more seasons Undercover Boss can stick around because in the beginning, it was easy to do this. You would send somebody undercover and pretend that they're on a reality TV show and they were able to work undercover. But as we've seen over the seasons, a lot of them, their identities are starting to come out very early on. So I don't think this show can last much longer. Because people are already going to expect if someone brand new comes in with a camera crew, it's quite likely they might be from the corporate office, and then, of course, they'll adjust their behavior accordingly. They won't do some of the stupid things that some of the people did in the first few seasons. Now, number six on my list is also a CBS show. CBS will rule this entire list from pretty much here on out, because CBS does reality TV a lot better than anyone else. It's The Amazing Race. The Amazing Race has won Emmys left and right for a very good reason. I mean, this show is very interesting, very entertaining. It never really gets stale or old. The challenges may be sort of repeated from season to season, but there are new locations. There's brand new, brand new challenges that are brought in all the time. New rules to the game that kind of refresh it. And I mean, they have to refresh. They really have to refresh this show, because I think it's like on, what, 23 seasons now? I mean, it's been quite a few seasons. Basically, it takes two people. They're either, you know, mothers and daughters, lovers, exes, best friends, frat boys, co-workers, whatever, whatever their relationship is. 
and they race around the world. They go to all these exotic locales in an attempt to win a million dollars. I had mentioned earlier about the Amazing Race curse, which has been talked about in some, some depth by reality TV bloggers. The show began in the shadow of the World Trade Center in that first season. And it actually started airing, I believe it got its air, it started airing right after September 11th. So where Murder in Small Town X ended right before September 11th, The Amazing Race began right after. So it was kind of difficult when people were watching this show after weeks of, you know, this horrific co news coverage to have to see the World Trade Center at the beginning and the end of that season. It's just very, very interesting how the Amazing Race managed to survive the bloodbath that was the network's canceling reality TV shows left and right. But the Amazing Race endured, and like I said, it has been quite a few seasons now. There's only been one season that has taken place entirely within North America. All of the other seasons have been international. There was one season where they actually had families that were running around. Now, that didn't go over very well because you don't want to be running around with children through all these strange challenges, and, you know, zip lining and stuff. I mean, most of the challenges, they were kind of dumbed down because they were children, you know, in the cast. But it was just a bad PR move, and that almost killed the series because the ratings are very low for that season. But The Amazing Race will be around for quite a while, I believe. It's a lot of fun. I will absolutely love the show. Now, number five on my list is Survivor. It began in Europe as a project called Project Robinson. It mainly got a lot of attention when it first premiered in the United States in the early 2000s. I think it was like 1999, 2000 was when the first season premiered. Because in Europe, in one of the one of the Project Robinsons in Europe. One of the people that got voted out or off the island committed suicide because they were just crushed by their portrayal on the show. And it was very controversial at the time, and it was one of the reasons why a lot of people were saying reality TV is it's not going to stick around for very long. Survivor was the first reality TV show to introduce immunity where people won't get voted out and they can tend to, sur to survive in the game. Prem premise behind Survivor was that people were supposed to be on an island, literally living with the bugs and the ants and, you know, the snakes and baboons. And they were eating whatever they could eat. Now, I don't honestly believe this at all. Because these people, while they will shed a lot of weight, they aren't emaciated like you would think people would be after a few weeks on a deserted, stranded island. They got production crews all around them. Production crews that are well fed. <laughs> you know, they're, they're sneaking Snickers bars back to those camps and eating. So I don't believe the whole idea that this is a reality TV show of them literally being stranded on an island. But. The show is fun, and I mean, it, it has gone through a lot of seasons, just like The Amazing Race. Heck, they're probably on season 50 by now, I can't keep up. In fact, there's this entire past season of Survivor. Even though one of the players <laughs> that ended up winning Survivor was one of my favorites from the previous season, I didn't even catch it this season. Because it's always on. <laughs> And I just don't have the time to keep up with Survivor. I mean, literally every single season, season of the year, there seems to be a Survivor. I think they do like three editions a year. Ain't nobody got time for that. Number four on my list of best reality TV shows is my, my favorite of the actual competition shows, Big Brother. This is a show where people are locked inside a house, cut off from the rest of the world, and they're literally streamed 24-7 over the internet. So you can watch them 
do all their embarrassing, dramatic, and sometimes quite boring day-to-day -day tasks on the internet. You have the live feeds, and I do always have the live feeds, and now that they also have the mobile live feeds, I watch them on the mobile feeds, too. It is my summer addiction. I literally can't sleep during the summer because I'm so addicted to Big Brother. It also comes on Showtime. After Dark, they have a spin-off show where if you have premium cable and you're watching Showtime, you can watch Big Brother. And these people do some crazy shit. It started out as a psychological experiment when it was in Europe. And it's kind of faded in Europe and the rest of the world. I mean, it's still going... They tend to do more celebrity editions overseas now than actual real editions of the show. The United States is still going pretty strong. Like I said, it ain't going away anytime soon because Julie Chen, host of the talk and host of Big Brother, is married to the CBS president, so it ain't going away for a while. Canada just recently got their own edition, and they modeled it exactly on the U.S. edition because... Canada watched the U.S. edition for many, many years and wanted their own edition and didn't get it until just recently. But the U.S. edition does not allow viewers to vote on the contestants. Maybe if the rest of the world would have paid attention to this and done this, then their editions wouldn't have started to fail in ratings. But the U.S. edition, you vote for a head of household who takes power in the house they choose two people for eviction, and the House then votes on who will go. You also have other things. you got the immunity that was first introduced in Survivor. You've got it on the show with the power of veto. To really understand Big Brother, you would have to watch the show. To understand these terms, they have a thing called Pandora's Box, which can reward or punish the head of household or the other house guests. You also have haves and have-nots. really is a very good psychological experiment because these people slowly over the course of a season, and it lasts usually 80 to 100 days. This season is going to be longer, they said, so there's going to be more house guests. But these people are put through a lot of stress, and you start to see them slowly going insane and paranoid. It's like they're in prison, and they don't want to be there, but they do want to be there because they will get half a million dollars if they stay all the way to the end. And they're voting out their friends, and they're voting out their enemies, but there are, you know, when they nominate people for eviction, you would think they'd be happy, right? No, you still have to live with those people for a few more days, and it's not going to be pretty. It's going to be awkward, 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 awkward. But the show has been one of my favorites. Even, even, I loved even season, season one when the viewers voted people out. I remember the season that it first premiered. We were on vacation, my family and I, in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, from Virginia, because I lived in Virginia at the time. Very boring up in Virginia. So we would always go on family vacation in Myrtle Beach. I think our family spent more time that summer sitting in front of the television in the nice, cool, air-conditioned hotel room watching Big Brother than we did actually out on the beach or at the pavilion. I think the pavilion's gone now, but we were so obsessed with the show. Everyone in the family was obsessed. Well, everyone in the family that went on that, <laughs> that vacation. Um, and starting with season two, I started auditioning for the show. I can't say I auditioned every season because sometimes I would actually make a video but not send it in. In those days you had to send in a VHS tape. Ugh. It was tedious. I remember my mom helped me make one of my audition videos one year. I'd come back from college. I went to college at Bradford University. And I was back home in Bluefield, Virginia where I was living and we were doing the video. And I tried living in my closet for a few days, eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, because that was really the only, at the time, there was no such thing as Big Brother Slop, which is a punishment if you don't win the food challenge. At the time, you ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So, that's what I ate before I did this audition video. 
and I tried to present the idea that I had been living in my closet for a few days. I didn't know how big this stupid closet was. I didn't take measurements. It was a small closet. Still a walk-in closet, but it was a small closet. And I remember in the video... <laughs> Then I was like, oh, it's like 8 foot by 5 foot. It wasn't really that big, but I didn't know. But I just said that in the video. And my mom makes a comment, a voiceover, as she's recording me. Damn, that's a really big closet. <laughs> Ruined the whole audition video, but I still ended up sending it in anyway. I'm sure the producers were like, this kid is an idiot. I'm sure they probably think the same thing that my my other videos that I've sent in. The past two years I have done online auditions because they finally now have online auditioning, which was something I had been complaining about on Twitter for years. I was tweeting the casting director, I was tweeting the producer. I even sent a whole freaking letter to the producer one year. I was like, you better have online auditioning next year. And they did the next year. But I also said in that same letter, that they should do a Clue-type show. Harkening back to the Murder in Small Town X theme, because I love that show. I love that idea. I told Big Brother that they needed to do that for the following season. For season 13. All of my friends that watched the show were so excited after they learned that I had sent this letter in, and when the house guests moved in, there was a Clue library room, which ended up becoming the Have Not Room. We all thought, woohoo, you know, my letter actually had an impact on the show, and they were going to do a clue mystery for that season. Eh, lasted one day. And then they changed it into Have Not Room, but I would like to think that I had something to do with that interior design of that room. But the Big Brother is number four on my list for most inventive and innovative shows. Now, number three, again, another show that no one probably watched. Forever Eden on Fox was one of the very few instances of Fox reality TV that I actually got into. For a few years, I was into American Idol. But Forever Eden took a premise that Fox had gotten known for. Like, they had Temptation Island, Paradise Hotel. These shows where they would put singles in in environment and hope that these sexy singles would hook up. Well, Fox was controversially known for trying to put that trash TV on television. Forever Eden was similar. It was the same concept. It was a luxurious place where the contestants ended up going. The innovative thing about the show, and it only lasted like eight episodes before it was cancelled, but it was picked up in other countries, like Israel was really popular. So they got to see the whole, I think it was like 45 episodes, I think, I don't know. It was a long, long season. They got to see all of the episodes, and it was pretty popular, but it was never brought back. But Forever Eden was called Forever Eden because the idea was that you would literally give up your driver's license, your credit cards, your cell phones, your whole identity to live in luxury forever in Eden. But there would be a price to pay. Of course, there's always a twist, right? You just had to vote people out. You had to literally fight for survival in this place. And, of course, your chances of literally being there forever were very slim. But the, if the show had lasted, there was a potential for your favorites to be there for years and years and years. It was a great concept. It just failed miserably. It lasted one season, well, technically half a season, and was never brought back. But I would love to see the show return. Number two on my list was another show that unfortunately got the axe after 9-11. The ratings just fell off. I think it lasted two seasons on ABC. It was called The Mole. It was another reality TV show that was ported over from international locations. It has international 
editions that are still going on in other places around the world. It's kind of fallen off, though. The whole idea was that one person, out of all the contestants, was trying to sabotage all the other contestants from winning. This mole would be revealed in the end. Your goal was to try to rat out the mole and win the competition. It's kind of like a James Bond type show. It's very interesting. The premise was truly novel. Unfortunately, ABC did not want to continue carrying this show, so they axed it. That brings me to number one. Now, number one is very much like The Mole, and it was set to premiere on ABC as well in 2001, right before September 11th. That was when the show was supposed to be wrapping up. They were supposed to start filming. And it never even made it to the air. That may seem strange in my top 12 list of shows, groundbreaking shows. Why would I put something on that never aired? Well, the main reason was because if this show had aired, I think it would still be on, on TV to this day. It would be like The Amazing Race, Survivor, and Big Brother. It would have that longevity. Because it was very, very hyped at the time. But network executives were starting to get tired of reality TV by the time it was supposed to air. And after September 11th, no one wanted to pick this show up, mainly because of the plot of the show. You're a fugitive, running from justice, across the United States. You're competing in challenges, trying not to be noticed by the public. They were going to take the Big Brother thing, where you're constantly on camera. They were going to have hidden cameras all over the country, instead of all over a house, and any potential viewer had the opportunity to win the grand prize that the runner, the runner is the name of the show, that the runner was trying to win. The viewers themselves, if they found out who the runner was and ratted them out and turned them in for the reward, the viewer could be the ultimate winner. Loved the idea of the show. I even auditioned for the role of the runner. It never came to pass. It's a very, very interesting idea. Because even if you didn't get on the show as a runner, you could still end up winning. Just by watching the show. The idea was first proposed by Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. It was actually their show. They were producing it. Which is another reason why it was innovative. Because these were Hollywood stars who... They, they hadn't been directing at the time. They hadn't gotten into that field yet. But this could have been a major, major bank maker for them. They could have been the Mark Burnett's of reality television. Mark Burnett went on. He's the producer of Survivor. He's now the king of reality television. But they could have made so much money off of this project, which never came to pass. Now, in 2006, Yahoo tried to pick it up and do an internet version, and they were still trying to get it to come to television. But as we all know, Yahoo has their own problems, corporate-wise. So it just, it just never materialized. That is my top 12 reality TV shows. What are some of your favorite reality TV shows? And which shows do you think that I missed the mark on? Or that I should have added to my list? Comment below. Do video responses. You could do text responses in the comments field. Or you can just email me if you would like. But I want your responses. I'm also on Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, 
Facebook, add me. Tumblr, add me on Tumblr. I love Tumblr. But that's all for this video, and I will see you guys shortly.